Am I there? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I think over the years you heard uh, many talks from our group, I'm sitting over there, uh, by the way, um, about this word complexity. But what does complexity mean exactly? Um, <clears throat> Well, there is a composition argument, uh, a composition aspect to complexity, of course. A system might be considered complex when it consists minimally of a large um, set of components, a large set of levels, a large set of interactions. Um, but what attracts us the most to these systems, what makes them interesting for us as researchers, is that they are capable of performing simple tasks. The things that I'm doing right now, I'm standing, I'm walking, gesturing, speaking. And these tasks are simple in the sense that they can be described in only a few degrees of freedom, far less than the degrees of freedom of the system itself. And this is even true for more psychological uh, constructs like personality, which we tend to wrap up in only five dimensions, right? Um, it is the task of complexity psychologists to understand how this very diverse behavioral simplicity emerges out of the underlying system complexity. Um, what I want to do in this talk is to give you one particular element of proof in this, and I want to approach this from a different angle. So here you see Jackson Pollock's painting number 14. Uh, it's a famous example of action art. Uh, and this painting is complex in many ways. Um, but the complexity can actually be proven, it can be calculated. Uh, that is to say, there is a number that tells you exactly how complex this is. Well, if you look close to this painting, you see that it consists of many elements that all come together in a nice way and form a whole, right? There are these drops of paints. There are smaller and slightly larger uh, splashes. And there are a couple of these big smears, right? And they all come together. Uh, fractal scaling helps us to quantify this. Um, and there is a number called fractal dimension that actually tells you how complex this painting is. And for this particular painting, that number is 1.43. Um, fractal scaling tells us uh, a couple of things. Um, why is this interesting, the fractal scaling? Well, of all the measures that you can use to quantify art, um, this is the one that uh, captures the spatial structure in the best way. And it's very powerful at that. It is even so powerful that it helps you to distinguish different paintings by, uh, by Pollock that he painted in different periods of his life. Um, but there is another thing. Um, fractal scaling not only tells us about the spatial structure of the painting, it tells us about the process of painting. So here's the artist at work. And he's moving uh, a lot. And fractal scaling tells us about how all the movements that he makes and how they come together, and how these movements interact with the physical properties of the paint, of the canvas, of uh, uh, gravity even. And how all that comes together with the uh, uh, mental, emotional state of the artist and the goals that he has for this painting. Uh, it is like one of the art critics says about uh, uh, Pollock's work, what was to go on canvas was not a picture, but an event. So here's one participant <clears throat> in one of our studies. Um, and usually we prepare, prepare these people, uh, a participant, in a certain measurement context, uh, in this lab, or maybe in this lab. And then uh, we give them a bunch of instructions, like this. Uh, and then we attach them to some measurement system, uh, something for data collection. Uh, it can be a physiological measurement, uh, maybe speech, some aspect of motion, eye movements, some response variable, or whatever. And all this interacts with, well, the emotional, social, uh, uh, cognitive, and perception action states of this participant. And what we gather in such a study usually is not a painting, of course, but a time series, something like this. And this looks nothing like a painting, maybe. But if you look closely, there's a lot of structure there. What you see is points, the data points. All right? But these data points aren't independent. They form arcs, smaller arcs, slightly larger arcs, and even very large arcs over different periods of time. And just like in the spatial analysis of Pollock's painting, fractal scaling can help us to determine the temporal structure of this particular behavioral sequence. And fractal scaling tells us about what the participant was actually engaged in on many different levels. And for this particular uh, uh, time series, that number is 1.20. OK, so why is this interesting? Why bother? Um, well, 
there are two aspects to that question. The first one is theoretical, and I would like to reserve that question maybe for during the coffee break. The second one is practical and, and the empirical method of this, uh, the empirical merit of this particular measure. And I can say that over the years, there are many very strong, convincing examples of the use of fractal scaling in the behavioral sciences. And generally speaking, fractal scaling has helped us to distinguish between different groups, different clinical groups, uh, different levels of performance, uh, different tasks, different uh, conditions. And generally, very generally, fractal scaling is related to well-coordinated, efficient, better performance. And fractal scaling can distinguish different groups, for example, just like uh, it can distinguish different paintings by Jackson Pollock. And here are three examples from our own research. If you look at the, the fluctuation in state self-esteem of adolescents during interaction, fractal scaling is present in that, and it is associated with the autonomy level. If you look at the response time variability in uh, lexical decision task, uh, fractal scaling can distinguish be between dyslectic and average reading children, and it is very strongly negatively associated with the, the, the severity of the reading impairment. As a third example, if you look at uh, competitive rowers, fractal scaling separates excellence levels of competitive rowers. All rowers have fractal scaling, but the better rowers have more of it. And these three studies, as many more, have, are very strong and convincing in showing that there is system complexity underlying uh, uh, all of human behavior. Okay, so what about two people? What about dyadic interaction? Are two people more complex than one? It turns out that they are not. Um, here's an example of our own lab. Uh, a very simple study that I'm going to show you, a very recent study from our own lab. Here are two participants that we brought into the lab and we just simply had to um, uh, let them move with a Wii mode control across the screen, a cursor. Each had their own cursor and for 100 seconds they simply moved the cursor across the screen. Um, <clears throat> this is a very simple study and the interesting thing is in the analysis. We an analyze this on two levels, the behavioral simplicity level about performance and the system complexity level about fractal scaling. And there is a lot to say about this study, but I'm only going to focus on one thing. I'll show you one basic result. So here is the result when two participants were, uh, the participants were doing the task alone. So they were just moving a cursor across the screen for 100 seconds without the other participant even present, right? This is a baseline. Uh, each dot is a diet with the fractal scaling of one participant on the horizontal axis and of the other participant on the vertical axis. There is no correlation here at all, but why should there be? They're doing the thing, the task, uh, individually. Now here's the same scatter plot of fractal scaling, but now when the participants were doing the task side by side, right? Each dot is again a diet, and what you're looking at now, the difference between these two graphs, is called the complexity matching effect. And this might seem as a very simple, straightforward result, right? But this is not behavioral matching. What this shows is that the participants are connecting on a level that transcends the temporal uh, uh, restrictions that we usually uh, impose on them uh, within a task. Um, it is like that they're not painting the same painting, but they're painting one of the same complexity. Okay, to conclude my talk as a punchline, when you're doing research, I would like to advise you, get in touch with your participants' inner Pollock. It will paint you a pretty picture, I think. Thank you.